Welcome to Spit Bucket. We're here on location and I'm sure all wine lovers will know exactly where we are by just having a look at those mountains, one of the world's most recognisable labels. And if you don't, how does that look? Clearly for anyone who didn't recognise our mountains over there, this label, I'm sure you'll recognise it, Cloudy Bay. We're here at Marlborough in New Zealand. We're about to be joined by Tim Heath, who's the uh, head winemaker here at uh, Cloudy Bay. He's an Australian, but he's gone across to the dark side. Uh, he's been here a couple of years, and I'm actually going to try and get him to talk about fishing, because he's a mad keen fly fisherman, um, and I want to find out some of these secret rivers. Oh, Marl Marlborough. It's, the, it's ground zero for Sauvignon Blanc. It does a lot of other things very well. They tend to get left in the wake of Sauvignon Blanc, which dominates the plantings, dominates the wines. In fact, I mean, it does so for all New Zealand, but this is, this is where the top savvies come from. And you're looking at some of, some of the vines out behind us. Tim Heath, winemaker at uh, Cloudy Bay. Savvy, New Zealand savvy, Marlborough savvy, Cloudy Bay savvy. What, what makes this so great? This, this is surely New Zealand's most famous wine. Yeah, it would certain, certainly be up there uh, amongst the, the top of them. Um, you know, we've had some success over the years, you could say. We're quite humble about that. We've just focused on getting the job done in a quiet, very sort of Kiwi fashion and uh, been fortunate over the years, I guess, to have some, some pretty solid success. But in this region, um, this seems to work with the Sauvignon vine. Uh, it's just a, a lovely, almost natural symbiosis that exists between the climate, soil and that, that variety. And um, as far as Sauvignon goes from New Zealand, this is the place to be. Um, but in saying that, there's also plenty of other things that, that grow well here. But, but Sauvignon, it's incredibly distinctive from this part of the world. Marlborough Sauvignon is uh, unmistakable in the glass. The making of, of, of this savvy, can you give us a quick rundown from vineyard to bottle? Yeah, sure. So um, it all starts in the field, um, in the vineyard, and that's really where that wine's made. Mm -hmm. um, and we're all wine. All good wine should be made. It's mm -hmm. about growing good fruit in the right places within your little little part of the world. Mm -hmm. So you sit on the yields pretty tight, uh, a lot of attention to canopy management to get the right flavour profile. Mm -hmm. Then harvest the grapes, bring them in nice and cool, uh, press off nice and gently. We discard all of our heavy pressings because they tend to be ugly and age quite, quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think as we you know, looked at those older wines yesterday, I think you can really see that long term that pays off. Mm. Um, cool fermentation with relatively, I'd say, neutral yeast that don't colour the wine up a lot. We've mm -hmm. got enough flavour in the grapes to, to sort of have enough presence in the glass without pumping it up and turning it into a wine on steroids. But yep. it's pretty, it sounds simple. It's a sort of clean, um, not clinical wine making, but it's an act of preservation rather than building a lot of uh, funk into the wine. There's another one that I get to take my white gloves off and and do that with. I mean, if it, if it, if it were that simple, everyone would be doing it. Yeah, um, and it sounds simple, but it's not. Mm. Um, lots of small parcels. In, in many respects, that wine is, is handled like you'd expect a Pinot Noir to be handled. Every little tiny mm. block is harvested separately, and then a lot of work goes into putting it together. And, and comes out, I mean, for me, you've got the vibrancy, the, the, the good flick of acid through it, and the yep. sort of the, the flavours of uh, sort of almost passion fruit and stuff that come through. Yep. Um, which is, if you like savvy, that's what, what you'd be looking for. Yep. And I think that's what a lot around the world, uh, or in other, other parts, maybe the New World, maybe France is a little different, but yeah. they, they aspire to that sort of style. Yep. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people think about savvy is it's, it's almost like a non-vintage champagne in that it's consistent year to year. Yeah. Um, as we, you mentioned uh, some of the older ones. Yesterday we did a bit of a vertical. Um, yep. Some worked better than others, yep. but as uh, the 01 looked amazing. Great, yep. The 06 and the 010, and yeah. as we were saying before, the, the, there's a link between the 06 and the 010 because they both had that, I mean the 06 looked still very young. Um, yeah. Uh, they both looked uh, uh, terrific examples. Yeah, so. yeah. I think um, for me it's about setting things up so that, you know, they are immediately attractive and, and nice and vibrant and punchy and full of those, you know, those lovely classic flavours like sweet green herbal tones and lots of citrus and up into your tropical spectrum. Mm. But um, you don't want the age, uh, want the wine to sort of turn into this vegetal tin peas, asparagusy sort of um, thing. It's um, you know you get the odd vintage that may just tend that way regardless of how hard you've tried. But yeah. through those wines that we looked at back 
you know, through 10 years, mm. I didn't really see any of those characters strongly in the glass. Um, they were pretty consistent, but those wines that you mentioned, mm. the, the 01, the 06 and the 10, um, they're all sort of right in that sweet spot in terms of flavours that we want to achieve. So you're talking effectively absolute classic textbook savvy yep. with this fella and throwing out the, uh, the rules with its neighbour. Now yeah. which will, this is the 07 Tococo. Tococo. If you want to tell us about it. Yeah, like, like you were saying, we kind of took the, took the textbook and threw it through the crusher to stemmer and destroyed it uh, with this wine. I mean, it does take some, some influence from, uh, say, White Bordeaux and some interesting wines from the, the mm -hmm. Loire Valley. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very much Marlborough and I think goes beyond that. It's very much Cloudy Bay in its style. It has a very strong personality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not all about those fresh flavours that we were talking about with the first wine. It it's, certainly isn't. It's more about funk, savouriness and, and texture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that to me is what this wine is about. The, the textural side of it is, is uh, what really shows first for me. And then the flavours and aromas play a, a supporting role um, in this wine to me. So uh, the texture that you get in this, I think is terrific. Mm. And if you could take the texture out and leave the flavours and put it, put the texture into some other wines, you, it would be fantastic. I struggle with the flavours, sure. but I do like the texture. Sure. Uh, See, I take it almost as a compliment that you, you, know, you at, at least it's a wine that's made you think, mm. and that's that's what it's about. It's um, it breaks the mould for what a, a classic Marlborough Sauvignon or Sauvignon from Marlborough should look like. Mm. And I think that messes with people's heads a little bit. But um, you know, it doesn't have all of those fresh, clean flavours. It's, it's sort of nutty, savoury, dried herbs, lemon thyme, nectarines, and then just funk. On that note, time to uh, actually go back to an 01. Yeah. Which I think uh, this will be very interesting. Yeah. And, and this was under cork, so we'll have to wait and see whether the, the bit of tree bark held up or not. Exactly. But, uh, these wines are built to are built to age. I think wines, um, white wines that are held on yeast leaves for quite a long time, are uh, naturally built to. Well, they're set up to go the distance. I mean, there's probably more to it than just that, but mm -hmm. it's it's a wine that we feel tracks along quite nicely. Much deeper colour. Yeah, as you'd I mean, as you'd expect. Wine, yep. um, but you know, that's an interesting wine that, um, provided you get one with a good piece of uh, tree bark in the top, as you said. It's still very much alive. That sort of comes across a much more smoky character. Yeah, yeah. And is that was, what they develop with age? Yeah, yeah, you get more of those sort of dried herbs, smoky tones coming through. Um, this was quite a funky wine in its youth, um, quite a lot of solids in the ferment. And that's something or other that um, I've been going back to probably through both of these wines, just looking at that textural uh, thing. Still got the get. texture. Yeah, still mm. got the texture. And it's actually, the extra time seems to have settled, it knocked off the, the really funky, Yep. Potentially offensive, uh, if I may use that. Um, <laughs> it's a hard man. I, I use that in the nicest possible way, of course. But uh, for those who, who, who don't like this style of wine, that's had those edges knocked off a bit, and, yep. it, and it actually comes across yeah. as a much more pleasant style. Yeah, if, if, I mean, from your point, you know of what view, I mean. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's they are great food wines, and um, yeah, that's where that wine. Whether it may be if, if, really if, you're, if, if you're someone who loves this style, you may not get as excited with the older ones. Possibly. Whereas I'd go the other way. I think that's, that to me is more appealing than the younger style, but yeah. I can see why people would go the other way. Yeah. And then that's just a completely different kettle of fish. A different beast. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for this. Not a problem. We'll be back shortly with the aromatics. Sounds great. Remember, we spit so you don't have to.